Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining my video where today we're going to be talking about functions. There's two parts to this video. The first part is determining whether or not a table, a mapping, or a graph is a function or not. And the second part is going to be evaluating functions. So let's get started first with determining is this a function, yes or no. And we're going to be looking at three things, a table, a mapping, and a graph. So first one is a table. So here on my screen, on the left, we're going to see a table that is a function. And on the right, we're going to see a table that's not a function. So if I gave you, <coughs> excuse me, this table here, okay, look at this table. My x, y columns, I have negative 2, 2, 0, 3, 1, negative 1, 2, 4. If I gave you a table that looked like this, we're going to be able to say that this is a function. Because each x value only has one y value, or we would say each x value is paired with only one y value. Negative 2 just goes to 2. 0 just goes to 3. 1 just goes to negative 1. 2 just goes to 4. I don't see negative 2 working with any other y value. Each x value has just one y value. A big note for a table is that we notice the x values do not repeat. So if each x is only being used once, then that would mean that I don't see any repeating values. Whereas on the right hand side, which is gonna be about not a function, here's what we're gonna take a look at. And let me just fix my screen here a bit. Sorry. Um, in this table here, if I gave you this, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 2, negative 1, 1, 2, negative 3, what we should notice immediately, and I highlighted it and boxed it here, is that this is not a function because the x value of negative 1 is repeating. It's literally the opposite of what this is saying over here on the, on the left. So I would know this is not a function because the x value of negative 1 is paired with two y values. The negative 1 matches up with a 2, and the negative 1 matches up with a positive 1. Another way to determine that it's not a function is simply just seeing that that x value repeats. Now notice I'm so focused on the x values. Everything's on the x values, and that's how you determine a function. Each x value has just one y value. It's okay, y's can repeat all they want, but the x's cannot. So now we're going to look at a mapping, and if you watched my previous video, you know a mapping are those two ovals, and we map on the x's to the y's, and we draw those arrows. So if I took this table and I put it into a mapping, this is what it would look like, okay? Negative 2 maps on to 2. 0 maps on to 3. 1 maps on to negative 1. 2 maps on to 4. Notice there was no repeating in either of my ovals. So here, I would know just by looking at this mapping of the same exact table values that this is a function because each x value maps onto one y value. Notice there's only one arrow drawn from each x value. Notice there's only one arrow coming from the negative 2, only one arrow coming from 0, and so on. And that's what my last tip for you is. Now, if I took this table and I put it into a mapping, look at what that looks like. Negative 3 maps onto negative 2, but notice negative 1, and I highlighted it for us, is getting two arrows being drawn from it. So this x value is showing me that it's being used twice. The negative 1 goes to the 2, the negative 1 goes to the 1. So if that x value has two arrows being drawn from it, and it's mapping onto those two different y values, then that's not a function. Okay, so this table is good, and obviously as a mapping, it also is showing the same results. This table and this mapping both show us it's definitely not a function. doesn't follow the definition. Now, if I was to take those tables and graph them, here's what the first graph would look like if I took that table and I plotted those points. If you see a graph that looks like this, this is just one example, this is a function because it passes what's called the vertical line test. The vertical line test is pretty simple. It says anywhere you draw a vertical line, it only passes through one point. So I have the ability right now to create a line for us and I'm going to draw a vertical line pretty easily. And notice, if I take this vertical line, here's what the vertical line test is. If I take this vertical line and I drag it across my graph, 
Here it goes through one point. If I keep dragging it across, it goes through one point. If I keep dragging it, it goes through one point, and then it goes through one point. If you can take a vertical line and run it through a graph, and at any point it only goes through one point, it passes the vertical line test. But look what's going to happen if I take those ordered pairs from the right-hand side and I graph them. It will not pass the vertical line test. If I took my vertical line, here it passes through one point, but now look, it actually passes through two points. And it's the two ordered pairs from here. It's negative one, two, that's up here, and negative one, one. So if I just have a graph, I don't have a table, I don't have a mapping, I can determine that whether it's a function or not, whether or not it passes the vertical line test. Good. Let's go on to part two now of functions. Part two is about evaluating. So we have to know right from the beginning that we're so used to dealing with equations that start with y equals. So here if I gave you this classic equation, y equals 3x minus 4, we know that we would input our independent values into x, We'd plug in values for x, we'd get our y values, maybe we'd make a table, graph our line, all that good stuff. But an equation can be written in what's called function notation. Function notation simply means that we replace the y, this here, with f of x. Okay? Now, here's what I always tell my students every year about function notation. Let's say for a moment I asked you to evaluate this equation. And I said to you, okay guys, let x equal five. I wanna know what y is if x is equal to five. So you'd go ahead and you'd do y equals three and you would plug in a five and you'd be good to go. And then you would evaluate it. Three times five is 15, 15 minus four is 11. And this would be your answer, y equals 11. Very nice, but that's just it. That what I box right there just simply says y equals 11 which is great, but look what function notation does. Function notation says, okay, if x is equal to, gonna be equal to five, I'm gonna replace x with a five. So I've got an x here in my notation, it's notation only, it does not mean f times five, which is five f, it means none of that. And then I go ahead and I do three times five minus four. Look what's gonna happen. f of five is my notation, and then 3 times 5 is 15. 15 minus 4 is still 11. But look at the difference between the results. This one simply says y is equal to 11, where this one is like a full sentence. This is saying when the x value is 5, the function's value is 11. It says everything. It actually, in the answer, tells you what you plugged in and what the result would be, whereas y equals 11 just tells you the result. So function notation is really, really helpful for that because when we see something in function notation, we don't have to go back and see what number we plugged in. It's actually telling us, hey, when you substitute in this number, this is the result. And that's why function notation is so nice. And so we're going to use that going forward here to do some evaluating. It says here, evaluate if f of x equals 3x minus 4. So we're going to use that same function. And then I'm going to give you another function, g of x equals 2x squared minus 3x. And we're going to be evaluating using these two different functions. And we just have to make sure we use the correct function as we're going through these problems. So here on the left, I see f of 2. And then number 2 says g of 4. And I think it's going to be pretty clear that whatever variable you see, that's the function we use. So if it says f of 2, we're going to use the f of x function. If it says g of 4, we're going to use the g of x function. And then it's really just order of operations. So f of 2. So that would mean I'd use my f of x function because it's f. Wherever I see an x, I'm going to substitute in a 2. So the 2 is going to go here, and the 2 is also going to go here. And this is what it would look like. f of 2 equals 3 times 2 minus 4. Now remember what I mentioned before. f of 2 is now function notation. We don't call it 2f. We don't change it at all. It actually stays that whole way through. f of 2 equals, f of 2 equals. And we do all the simplifying on the right-hand side. So now 3 times 2 is 6. 6 minus 4 is 2. And this is actually a full statement. It's saying when the x value is 2, the function value 
is 2. When I plug in a 2, the answer I get is 2. g of 4. If it says g of 4, that means I need to use my g of x function. I'm going to go ahead and every place I see an x, I'm going to substitute in that 4. So a 4 goes here, a 4 goes here, and a 4 goes here. So actually three spots. So g of 4 is equal to 2 times 4 squared minus 3 times 4. So I took this function here, and in the three spots I plugged in a 4. Now remember, just like I mentioned with f of 2, g of 4 is simply notation. So that g of 4 is going to hang out the whole way. Now I just have to use my order of operations very carefully. And this will always haunt us, especially all through Algebra 1 and Algebra 2. We have to use our order of operations to simplify this expression correctly. Now, order of operations. Parentheses and grouping symbols. No. Exponents. Yes. We must, must, must do 4 squared first and then take that answer and multiply it by 2. We do not do multiplying first and then exponents. Exponents become, come before multiplying. So 4 squared is 16. I can take care of that 3 times 4 over here because it has nothing to do with this. 2 times 16 is 32. 32 minus 12 is 20. So g of 4 equals 20. So this is saying when I substitute in a 4, when I plug in a 4, the function value is 20. Okay, it's a full statement. When I plug in a 4, my answer is 20. Okay, if you want to try these next ones on your own, you definitely could. I would pause the screen or just keep on with me. So f of negative 3, it's going to be just like f of 2. Wherever I see my x in my function up here, I'm going to substitute in that negative 3. So f of negative 3 is equal to 3 times negative 3 minus 4. Remember, f of negative 3 just hangs its notation. 3 times negative 3 is negative 9. Negative 9 minus 4 is negative 13. So we would say f of negative 3 is equal to negative 13. g of negative 4. So here I plugged in a positive 4. Now we're just going to simply turn it into a negative 4. Remember, g of negative 4 is notation. I work with everything else here. Remember, exponents first and then multiply. Negative 4 squared. A negative times a negative is a positive. So this is going to be 2 times 16, just like it was up here. But now, this was negative 3 times 4, which is negative 12. Negative 3 times negative 4 is a positive 12. So there's my difference. 2 times 16 is 32. 32 plus 12 is 44. So g of negative 4 is equal to 44. f of 2x. If I substitute in an f of 2x in, so it would be f of 2x. Wherever I have my x, it now gets replaced with a 2x. f of 2x is my notation. 3 times 2x is 6x. And then minus 4. Look, this is actually just the answer, guys. There's nothing to simplify because you can't do 6x minus 4. It just is what it is. G of 2x. So everywhere I have an x in my g function, I plug in a 2x instead. G of 2x. Now, 2x squared. That means 2x times 2x. 2x times 2x is 4x squared. So this becomes 2 times 4x squared minus 3 times 2x is 6x. 2 times 4x squared is 8x squared, and then it's just minus 6x. And I cannot combine them. They're not like terms. Now, my last two example problems for us. It has the function notation, but then it's got this little plus 5 at the end. So here's what this means. This means I continue business as normal. I substitute a negative 1 in for my x. But then, after I do that, and I'm going to highlight this here so you see what's going on. That plus 5 just really gets thrown in at the end. So I plug in a negative 1 in for my x values. But then I just simply add 5 at the end. So that's what f of negative 1 plus 5 is telling us to do. So f of negative 1 plus 5 would be 3 times negative 1, which is negative 3, minus 4. And then I'm simply just adding 5 at the end. Okay, negative 3 minus 4 is negative 7. Negative 7 plus 5 is negative 2. So this is saying f of negative 1 plus 5. I evaluated f of negative 1, and then I just simply added 5 to the end. 
Same thing with g of negative 1 plus 5. I plug in a negative 1 in for where x would be, and then I simply just add 5 right at the end. So I evaluate, I do business as normal, but then I add 5 at the end. So negative 1 squared is positive 1. Negative 3 times negative 1 is positive 3. 2 times 1 is 2, which just becomes then 2 plus 3 plus 5. And my result is then 10. So g of negative 1 plus that extra 5, the result is 10. I hope this video was helpful for you. Thank you so much for watching. And I hope you can watch my other videos for more help. Bye.